I'm your host today, Allison Weir, CNI board member and director of If Americans Knew. This show is a project of the CNI Foundation, which works for fair U.S. policies in the Middle East and fair discussion of those policies here in America. That's what we wish for. Find out more about us at our website, www.cnionline.org, or on our new blog, Fair Policy, Fair Discussion. Our guest on the show today is Jeff Halper. He is a professor of anthropology and co-founder and coordinator of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions, what many people call ICAD for short. Jeff is the author of several books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and is a frequent writer and speaker about Israeli politics and about the general situation of Israel-Palestine. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago with Palestinian activist and physics professor Ghassan Andoni by the American Friends Service Committee. The nomination stated, as the coordinator of ICAD, Halper has led nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience against the Israeli occupation authorities. He has put his own personal safety on the line, facing bulldozers in front of Palestinian homes and confronting Israeli soldiers. Jeff is originally from Hibbing, Minnesota, I believe it is, before immigrating to Israel in his early 20s. Welcome to the show, Jeff. I'm delighted to have you here. Thanks for having me on. There's so much to talk about, and I have a number of uh, people have already emailed questions to ask you. But I'd like to just start for a few minutes uh, with a little bit of your personal background. How did you end up deciding to move to Israel and become an Israeli citizen? And when, how soon and when and how did you begin to really grapple with the true nature of Israel and its core identity and of its founding in addition to the occupation? Well, you know, you have to put it back into the 60s. I mean, I'm a, chi- I'm a product of the 60s, a child of the 60s. There were two things. There was a push and a pull. push was that I really got turned off with life in the United States, to tell you the honest truth. I didn't find anything what? transcendent. The materialism was there. The, there was no substance that I could, I could grasp onto. So I was looking to leave. The was that in the 60s, we began to have um, a return to ethnic roots. You know, had Alex Haley's book, Roots, the African-American community began to come back to its roots and say, we reject the American melting pot. Our ethnic identities are important to us. And that was followed by Cesar Chavez and followed by the American Indian movement, AIM, and, and so on. And I got caught up with that. So my Jewish, my Jewish identity became very important to me, but not religious in any way. The only real expression for that was, in a sense, coming to Israel. When I came, it, it really did speak to me. I felt a sense of belonging here. I think that Jews aren't a stranger to this country. But I came with my eyes open. In other words, I never came as a Zionist. I came knowing there was an occupation, and uh, when I got off the plane, I became a part of the Israeli movement. One of the interesting things is today we use the word global, global economy, globalization, 60s, we didn't really have that word. A globe may be on your desk, but you didn't have global. The word we used was, if people remember, revolution. We talked about the revolution, that's really what we meant. So my feeling was that I was leaving the state, not to go to Israel, not to run away from the states, not to withdraw from involvement in the world, but simply to go to another front of the revolution. For me to come to Israel and immediately become critical and want to change things and end the occupation and uh, the just peace of Palestinians, there was no contradiction in that in my mind. So uh, everybody has their story. I don't know if I do the same thing today, although I'd probably leave the States today. I don't know where I'd go. In those days, it made sense within that context. What year was that that you went there? To tell you the truth, the first time I came was in 1966. I was on my way to Ethiopia to research the Jewish community of Ethiopia. After the 67 war, I was here for a while to learn Hebrew, and then I came back as a student. So I'd been here a few times, but I actually moved to Israel permanently in 1973, when I was 27. Did the problem of compulsory military service, was that something you had to confront at some point? Look, it was something I had to confront. I don't talk about it that much, but I did go into the Israeli army. I wasn't in a combat unit. You know, I was in my late 20s already. I became a lecturer in the army. I mean, I did reserve duty, everybody else, for 20-some years. 
as a lecturer. I refused to serve in the occupied territories. I was a member of a group called Yish Gvul in those days, which is a movement of reserved soldiers that refu- refused to serve in the occupied territories, and I refused to carry a gun. But I did go in as a lecturer, I, and I rose to the rank of corporal. I, uh, I'm more proud of the fact that my three children were all conscientious objectors. I had my, my youngest son went to jail for a few terms. Looking back, I might yeah. not have done it, but I did do it in those days as a part of Israeli society. This is so interesting. And as you say, it's easy to look back, as I'm sure all of us have done as we get on in years. Mm-hmm. We sometimes think we made good decisions. Sometimes we don't. That's life. Um, what I'm wondering is... When you're serving with the IDF, you can you can tell them, no, I will not carry a gun, no, I will not be in combat? Or was this something you were officially doing, or was this just something you were able to work out with? The, the huh? number of conscientious objectors and mm-hmm. the number of people who refused to serve in the territories were, were so small, it really wasn't worth it for the Army to make a deal about it, to put us in jail mm-hmm. or to say no or to force us. So basically, the Army said, fine, no problem and simply made me a lecturer, which I was anyway in a sense. So it, it wasn't mm-hmm. really confrontational. Now, what about... Today, with now, the... today it is, by the way. Have today, yeah. young people, and there's a good number of young people, who are refusing to go into the Army. And they're really paying a price. They're getting sometimes a year, year and a half in prison. These are kids that really are putting their, their lives on the future, their lives on the line. But, uh, right. In my day, there were so few that... It really wasn't an issue. When you mentioned conscientious objector in the U.S., mm-hmm. quite often that has to be or is rooted in religion, where people will right. very often will be Christians and will say Jesus taught uh, against violence. Right. You know, the famous quote from the New Testament, mm-hmm. live by the sword, die by the sword. You know, there's a strong tradition, right. often forgotten mm-hmm. in Christianity of nonviolence. Now, in, right. in the case of of Israel, what, on what basis is conscientious objection argued and allowed? First of all, in international law, expected that every country should allow for conscientious objection. The right, human right that people have is not to serve in the army. Israel doesn't have that. The United States does. That's funny enough. Israel doesn't have conscientious objection. So it forces you to either resist the army or to go in. Basis mm-hmm. on, from my point of view, the basis was simply my own moral, my own moral judgment. You know, I don't need religion to tell me what's right or wrong. No, I'm an, I'm an, I, I, a strong adherent mm-hmm. of human rights, I'm including my own human rights. So I think it's a mixture of um, simply um, trying to do what's just and morally having certain standards and say, look, I'm not going to do these these things. I mean. I was very active in the 60s in the civil rights movement in the United States. It was a draft resistor against the war in Vietnam. I mean, I did all those things, and many of us did, without any religious background at all. Uh, yes, I recall that well, and uh, I also was involved in that. At that time, women weren't in the armed forces, so I didn't directly confront it. But, of course, my friends mm-hmm. and eventually husband, etc., were were part of that, the same generation. It does, just to go into this a little bit further, and then we'll go on to our current situation, but it is, I, I find it a little confusing and disconcerting mm-hmm. that you were a draft resistor in the United States, uh-huh. and yet knowingly went to Israel where you would have to serve and did, in fact, serve. What was your thinking about that? Or Look, did I'm not you a just not really... I would have served in the American Army, let's say, in World War II. You know, where there was a genuine uh, a threat, there was a genuine conflict, uh, you had the Hitler in, uh, in Germany and so on. So, you know, I think people can be selective, and they have to be selective over the wars they participate in and over every, everything yes. they do. Welcome back. Uh, this is Allison Weir, a board member of the Council for the National Interest and executive director of This Americans New with our guest today, Jeff Halper, the coordinator and a co-founder of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions. Well, Jeff, I've already, as I think I mentioned earlier, received some email questions. Plus, we have a caller online. Um, Mm -hmm. His name is Glenn from Washington, D.C. So I'll share this opportunity instead of diving in with my questions. I'll I'll try to now hold those a little while. And Glenn in Washington, D.C., what can we do for you? I have one observation which I'd like uh, Jeff to comment on. It seems Mm -hmm. to me the, the core problem is the definition of national security. Uh, 
The Israelis define national security as uh, physically attacking one another. The Palestinians seem to define national security as the right to life, the housing, uh, health services, etc. Uh, do you agree with that? And is there any way to bring the two together? Exactly agree with that. I think uh, say that Israelis define Israeli sec- national security as attacking each other is, um, is is maybe misstating it. The problem really isn't one of security. That's a buzzword like it is in the state. I think the problem is that, and, and I think you're right, that there's no symmetry. The problem is that the Palestinians are willing to live with Israelis. I mean, whether or not there should be an Israel or shouldn't be an Israel or it was colonial or Zionism, putting all that aside, the fact is there is an Israeli people today. There's a binational reality in this country the Palestinians are willing to deal with that. They're willing to have a two-state solution. They're willing to have a one-by-national solution and to try a lot of different things to resolve the conflict. Israel refuses the binational reality. Israel says no. This entire country, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, is ours exclusively. There is no Palestinian people don't recognize a, another people here that have rights of self-determination. Now, we do see there's a lot of Arabs around, individuals, but they don't add up to a collectivity with national rights. So the basis of the conflict is Israel is trying to impose an all-Jewish and Jewish-dominated, Jewish-defined state, the flag with a Star of David in the middle, exclusively for Jews, in a country that has at least a half of, of the population being Palestinian Arab. So the, the asymmetry is that the Palestinians are willing to deal with that reality. They don't like that reality, but they, they're willing to deal with it, whereas Israel isn't. And that's why Israel, that's the strong party in the occupying power, has really become repressive. And, and in, in, in that sense, you're, you're right. It defines national security as absolute pacification of the Palestinians, repressing any resistance of the Palestinians to colonialism and apartheid, something the Palestinians and no people can obviously accept. Because of Israel, in a sense, conflict is being perpetuated. There is no solution, if you look at it from the Israeli point of view, because it means the Palestinians have to give up being a people, identity, their history, their country, and no people will do that. Uh, Jeff, uh, following up on that, I've had a, a number of people emailed questions about the one-state solution, as, as it's mm. called. Uh, that's, of, as you know, more and more people are, are feeling that either that's the moral direction that things need to go, or almost mm. that it's practical because of the settlements. Israel sort of, as you've just described, sees right. the, whole, the whole area as, as a region. And that a one-state solution, which was is what was originally proposed by the PLO, calling for a secular state with equal rights for all people, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, to live together on the land. What are your personal views about that? And what are ways that that could happen or that that could be, that people could try to push for something like that? Or do you think that they should? Personally, I favor the one-state solution. You're right. I think it's a just solution. Not only that, but it's... The reality that Israel's created. And we can't blame the Palestinians for the fact that Israel, by its settlements, created one binational country. It's the reality. So Israel refuses to allow a, a genuine two state solution to emerge. It won't dismantle its settlements. So the only two state solution that could emerge from the Israeli point of view is apart. None of us can accept that. Israel's eliminated the real two state solution. If there's a one-state solution, I think the one-state solution is a very attractive one because it really means that we're living together, this country, and our future together. Now, national states are not, aren't easy states. Look at Sri Lanka, look at Cyprus, Belgium, and Canada. Their language differences. Our national states have their problems, so it's a real challenge to build something here that would work. Uh, I think that challenge is an exciting one. I don't see it as a threat. I see it as a exciting challenge. Problem yes, is, so why don't I advocate more for a one-state solution? Because I'm not a Palestinian. The view is that it's the Palestinians' prerogative. Tell us the solution is that they want. This is their struggle for liberation. 
I can't, you know, and you don't have one Palestinian voice like you had one voice in South Africa. South Africa, the ANC said one person, one vote, and everybody mobilized around that. You don't have Palestinians, including the Palestinian Authority, who wants a two state. There are other Palestinians that want one state. Some want it binational, some want it um, a more secular democratic state. You have other Palestinians like Hamas that say, yes, there should be one state, but no Jews in it. What you've got, and I can't, I don't have the right, I don't think, to tell the Palestinians what the solution is. So I work to end the occupation, which is much as I can do try to lay out what the different possibilities are, but I stop short of advocating a solution. I personally like the one-state solution. If the Palestinians decide in the end, through negotiations or who knows, maybe Obama will pull a rabbit out of the hat, who knows what will happen. If they decide that they can really get a two-state solution that they can live with, who am I to tell them, no, you shouldn't do it? So of course, I, I, guess, uh, uh, I hold back from the point of view of actually advocating a solution. I understand. I think you're, many of us feel that we are too ready often to impose our own solutions on other people's situations. Right. I do think, on the other hand, there's such an enormous power differential and so much manipulation. Mm -hmm. When you've got, you know, it ranges from 7,000 to 12,000 Palestinians in prison. That's giving right. enormous leverage by the enormously powerful Israeli side to impose even the discourse that's going on. So mm -hmm. many, you know, surveys will appear to show that Palestinians would prefer a two-state solution, but when you talk to the people, as I have and I'm sure you have, and you mm -hmm. say, well, yes, but what if it were possible for Palestinians right. to live in this whole land for you to go back to the original ancestral right. village that you're from? And they'll right. you know, almost always with exceptions, but almost always will say, well, of course, that's what I'd prefer. That's it's just right. not, quote, practical because they see the power dimension so massively in Israel's favor that they, you know, we're, I don't know if we're getting a real answer to the questions right, that right. we're asking. The other thing I, I'd like to bring up that uh, was Can I just say one thing about sure. that? Palestinians are caught between a rock and a hard. I think they all want the end of one state solution. Even if a two, they see a two-state solution as a stage on the way eventually to a one-state solution. I think, I think they're right about that. The problem is that this isn't some academic exercise. This is their lives. They have to also be sent, like you say, they're the weak side. Mm -hmm. Not yes. only vis-a-vis -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the international community. How can they maneuver, get some solution that they can live with so they don't continue dying under occupation? So that's where I think they're hesitant to give up the two-state solution, because it is the solution accepted by the international community. On the other hand, they're caught because they, they see it's not happening and it's not going to happen. But they're reluctant to go to what they would prefer and what's more just and, and what is practical, which is a one-state solution, because then they feel they'll lose all their international support, including that of the United States, and then they're back to square one, and they'll live for another 50 years under occupation. So I think they're in a very, very difficult dilemma, Palestinians, yes, from that yes. point of view. Jeff, thank you. And hold that thought. We can continue after. Welcome back. This is Allison Weir again with our guest today, Jeff Halper, the founder and uh, coordinator of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions. This is just a, a question for you, Jeff, about the escalation that there seems to be recently by Israel against nonviolent activists and participants mm -hmm. in the Palestinian territories in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been rounding up at least a hundred, I think, activists have been imprisoned or detained for a period of time from Nablus and Betlin, from Nitlin. Uh, several are in prison right now. There seems to be an escalation of that. They're going in at night, and last night they rounded up a few more. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, they've just deported the chief editor of the English site of Man News, one of the best news sources from the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. They're increasingly denying entry and deporting international people that are volunteering with really well-recognized humanitarian agencies in, right. in the Palestinian territories. Uh, how is it working with your organization, with ICAT? Are you beginning to have any problems there, or do you expect to? Or have you so far escaped that since I... Right. 
in your case, you're an Israeli citizen. Maybe that's giving your organization a little bit of insulation. Or okay, Israel is a democracy if you're Jewish. Oh, South Africa was a democracy if you were white. So as Israelis, we can out, we can write, we can have our organizations. We're not, not really limited in any way. That's completely different, of, obviously, from the international organizations and the international activists. So we have a protection that they don't have. It has been over the years that the greatest threat to the occupation, the continuing occupation, was the Palestinians and Palestinian resistance. Israel feels that it succeeded in pacifying the Palestinians. Like you say, 12,000 Palestinians are in prison. A whole generation of Palestinian leaders has been either assassinated or put in prison. Um, you have a, a, a wall twice as high as the Berlin Wall, encompassing tens of thousands of Palestinians in the West Bank. Gaza is an open-air prison. So that Israel feels that it's managed to pacify violently Palestinians. Today, major threat to Israel's continuing the occupation, the international civil society. You and uh, your organizations and CNI, churches all over the world, trade unions all over the world, all kinds of groups, human rights groups, political groups, university groups are all speaking out. And that's really what's scaring Israel. Governments it can deal with, but it, it can't deal with civil society. I think this struggle is getting to the proportions of the anti-apartheid struggle. So the biggest threat to Israel's policies today, ability to hang on to the territories, are the international activists, the Palestinians. And that's why you're beginning to see the same repression of international activists. Now, Israel has a problem. It can't kill them, really. It can't put them in prison because they're, they're citizens of other countries. But Israel certainly is coming down and... Uh, and harassing people in prison, expelling them, allowing their organizations to work, trying as much as possible to prevent anyone from not only from protesting, from, from but from documenting the, uh, the the outrages that are happening. So I would say that in many ways it's the international activists who are today the greatest threat to uh, to Israeli uh, occupation. That's why you get the repression. On that point, let's seg segue to some people from this country who are, have some questions here. I agree with your point, and I think it's the international, the unity that's starting to evolve uh, right. among internationals, among Palestinians, and among the Isra Israelis who have, uh, you that's know, right. the portion of the Israeli population that has become very active on this and very, very principled. So I think it's this very strong international coalition that's emerging. Let's take the question from Eugene, Oregon, Mariah. What do you have? What would you like to ask today? Uh, thank you for taking my call. And hello, Jeff. We were able to host you in Eugene. And, I remember. Uh, yes, I think we all understand that the three groups of Palestinians, the, the Israeli, the so-called Israeli Arabs, and, and uh, citizens of Israel and the uh, people in the illegally occupied territories and the refugees and diaspora have not been included in these peace negotiations. Well, the right of return under international law for all Palestinians ethnically cleansed by Israel would cost Israel its Zionist goal of a Jewish majority. This, uh, along with sharing Jerusalem, has motivated Israel's long sabotage of peace negotiations even though uh, Israel has agreed to honor both, con both as conditions of its 1949 admission to the UN. My question is actually two parts. Shouldn't our activism be focused on um, pressuring Israel to comply with those two conditions, especially since it can, Israel can still remain a homeland for the Jews without a Jewish majority? I agree. I mean, I, I think the vision of a, of a binational country of people living together, but each people having its narrative and having its um, its national existence, but not necessarily in a, in a state of its own, is is a vision that I think is doable. It's difficult, but doable, and I think that's the vision of the future, because that's the reality. But the problem is, how do you get Israel there? Because it's not going to cooperate. Here's where I think you touch on an important uh, issue. The mechanisms for forcing Israel to end the occupation are there. 
There are laws uh, for the right of return of Palestinian refugees. International law says Israel is not allowed to build settlements or make its occupation permanent. The wall has gone to the International Court of Justice. Um, war criminals that have done the Gaza invasion should be brought before the International Criminal Court. In other words, you have international law, you have human rights, you have international courts, you have the UN system, and you even have international court systems, for example, in an American court. You're supposed to be able to try war criminals under universal jurisdiction, something that the American courts have never accepted, even though that's a part of international law. The mechanisms exist. What's weak? The implementation. I think this isn't only the case in terms of Israel. I think in terms of, of many uh, uh, third world countries, many uh, oppressive regimes, the inability to hold them accountable, and I mean, I would even throw China into there, the inability of the international community to implement its own laws and regulations, force human rights and, and countries to obey human rights and international law, is the biggest problem we're facing today. So in a sense, the laws are on the books. The governments of the world, led by the United States, refuse to enforce those international laws and norms of human rights and U.N. resolutions. That's where we're stuck, and that's why you need a strong civil society movement to force the governments to do what they should be doing anyway. Because if they simply complied with international law, if just the fourth Geneva Convention was mm -hmm. applied to Israel, the occupation would fall apart by its own illegality. And that's really what we have to do. We have to start in insisting that our members of Congress and senators and others act according to international law. We have to really have the, a new kind of international perspective, I think, in American politics. I think you're right, and I, I, I share that analysis. I think it's, it's going to require a grassroots movement. I think uh, the U.S., population uh, is going to need to start to join together in ways to start to challenge this far more successfully than has been done in the past. With me is Jeff Halper, the uh, founder and coordinator of the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions. Jeff writes and speaks on this issue, but he does a, a great deal more. He puts his body on the line confronting Israeli soldiers. Online with us is Michelle, who has a question for you. At least I hope we have Michelle. Okay, well, I think I have her question, because as I mentioned, we had gotten some emailed to us, and uh, I'm, this might be the person that had emailed earlier. Let me see if I can read it here. Quote, today the Palestinian voice or cause is all too often mediated through or represented by Jewish Americans or Jewish Israelis. These individuals, and she names several, may perhaps be crowding out Palestinian and other non-Jewish voices in the finite social space devoted to Israel-Palestine. Right. She thinks that therefore they enable inadvertently or not others mm -hmm. who are uncomfortable having Palestinians and Arabs speak for themselves and that also this situation can lead to a constriction of the paradigm that's even discussed for so long mm -hmm. the right of return was not discussed one state was not discussed the power of the Israel lobby was not discussed so I think she wanted your comments about that. First of all, uh, we don't impose ourselves on anyone. If I come to speak as a Jewish Israeli, I'm invited. So, I mean, the, uh, and I'm not invited by Jewish groups. <laughs> so, I, those comments should be directed at whoever, whoever invites us, whether they're uh, pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian or, or whoever they are. It, it shouldn't be directed. We're not to blame for that. I think, on the contrary, I think it turns it around. I think that a critical Israeli voice and a critical Jewish voice is a very important part of the discussion. Uh, we don't, I don't think, we represent Palestinians. I certainly don't. When I said earlier that I'm, I, I stopped short of advocating a solution, it's precisely because I can't represent the Palestinians. And I'm very aware of that. But to have an Israeli or to have a Jewish person speak out strongly against uh, the oppression of the Palestinians for Palestinian rights, to criticize Israeli policies and so on, I think that's, that's a good thing. It seems to me that that's a good thing. That's right. I and mean, I, I agree that, we're, that sometimes uh, 
we speak a lot, but, you know, there's also an, an issue that the Palestinian Authority doesn't really, it's not very good at advocacy in a sense. So you have some very good Palestinian civil society people. I think uh, some of them are speaking out very clearly. I agree that there could be many more Palestinians speaking out, um, but it's not the strategy for some reason of the Palestinian Authority. So I think that's a Palestinian issue. And whether you should have a Jewish speaker, Israeli speaker, Palestinian speaker is the issue of whoever is inviting. But I'm simply willing to speak out whenever I have an opportunity. And hopefully I'm not crowding anyone out. I know that Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions does put on some events, as I recall, at least used to have house parties, etc. Right. And perhaps there would be a chance to specifically invite as part of those and as some of the speakers that are proposed, not only Ghassan Andoni and Ali Abu Nima, right. a number of excellent speakers and writers could be, you could suggest when you're invited, well, I'd like to share the podium with so-and-so, or here's another right. speaker that you might like to invite also. Well, you know, it's an interesting For example, point. I'm coming out of the West Coast coast in, in February with Sabil. I mean, I, a lot of my speaking is done with Sabil, which is a Palestinian Christian liberation theology organization. And Sabil has had 30 conferences all over the United States. I think you, Allison, have been in, in a couple. And they bring mm-hmm. in there very much Palestinian. It's this Palestinian organization with Palestinian speakers. But I think they see the value of having Jewish and Israeli speakers as well. So, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, it's hard to, I, to I criticize yeah. people that are speaking out that they're speaking out too much. It, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of a well, strange it's a, twist. It's, a, it's, a good, it's, it's not a strange twist. I think people would have said that if uh, during the civil rights days, if it were only whites speaking disproportionately, even at the civil right. conferences, truthfully, I would say that the, the actually the Palestinians that are speakers are in a minority. That's what I've seen, and I right. think that's what's coming up. So I think that's a legitimate point. I certainly think if we were talking about gender issues and we mostly had males speaking on behalf of women's rights, Disproportionately, mm-hmm. many people would be unhappy and felt there was a bit of a problem with that. So, right. yeah, I think it's, but I don't it's think good to think about. Problem. I think, I mean, I wrote an article in the Journal of Palestine. No, I, unfortunately, uh, Palestine we've studies. got to jump in here. We've got two callers and only about two minutes, so let me t- quickly take Sarah from Detroit, and I hope we'll also get to Gloria from Akron. Sarah, could you quickly ask your question, and thanks for waiting. Thank you. It seems to me that an Israeli or uh, helping a Palestinian uh, while uh, remaining a citizen of Israel uh, is the equivalent of someone going to Iraq with, in an American tank and trying, to, and trying to help Iraqis. So my question to Mr. Helper is, since you have American citizenship to fall back on, why don't you renounce your Israeli citizenship, which is expressing the root of the problem, which is colonialism, settlerism in, Israel, in Palestine? Because exactly what I said before, I don't... I think that Zionism was a colonial movement. I think the Jews have a genuine tie to this country. I don't think it's like a British farmer that got up one morning and went to Kenya, or an American soldier that goes to Iraq. I don't think those are legitimate comparisons. I think the Jews have a legitimate place here. I think we can live with Palestinians, and we have to, and so on. The Palestinians are the indigenous people here. But I don't take away from my own narrative. And just like I don't, let me I just can't represent no, Palestinians, can have I don't want other people to represent me as well. Gloria from Akron, you have one minute if you could ask your question. Okay, okay, I'll make fast here. Uh, Bargudi, who's in prison, I hear is a very strong Palestinian leader. Would Israel allow a very strong Palestinian leader to emerge or do they want a weak leader, for one thing? Also, um, I understood Hamas would accept Israel at the 67 borders. We're very biased mm-hmm. in our news here. I, heard, I read today in the paper that uh, Israel responded to rockets. Let's take your, Jeff, could you, we have about 30 seconds, I'm guessing? Yeah, I mean, obviously Israel won't allow a strong Palestinian leader to emerge. Unless Marwan Baguti becomes a collaborator, I don't really see him getting out of prison. 